Welcome to the Dutch Cycling Embassy Think Bike Workshop results. Uh, this workshop happened in September 2022. Uh, it's by the by Timba, the Trekkie Meadows Bicycle Alliance, an all volunteer 501c3 organization. You can about, go to bikewasho.org for more information and build a better bike network.com to send a note to local officials to encourage them to install better bike networks. On the left-hand side here, a little bit about these pictures. Uh, that's the event that was sponsored by Patagonia over at Kraft, uh, where the representatives of the Dutch Cycling Embassy talked about what we were doing. Uh, on the bottom left, that is Center Street. There is no bike infrastructure. Bicycles are in conflict with vehicles. In the center, you can see an example of turn lanes that are throughout Reno and are not heavily used except by people uh, in micro mobility. For instance, there's somebody using a wheelchair to go down a turn lane that is not used by anyone to turn anywhere. Uh, and then on the right hand side, that's uh, my daughter, Ava, and she's at the Reno Bike Project. A little bit about me before we move on to our presentation. I'm Kai Plaskon, president of the Trekkie Meadows Bicycle Alliance from 2020 to 2023. I have 25 years of media experience and I'm an award-winning journalist. I've been bike commuting most of my life because it's easier than driving and it's good for my health and good for the community. All right, so now let's talk about uh, Reno and and implementing what was presented at the Think Bike Workshop. Uh, they've expanded protected bike paths in downtown Reno from zero miles of protected bike paths in 2022, four miles that's anticipated in 2026 and possibly more. It's network focus. So on the bottom left, you can see the network for downtown Reno of protected bike paths that are proposed. And it's connecting hubs, UNR, Midtown and downtown areas for improvement would be connecting to the airport, for instance, and to parks. So how do we do this? Uh, who participated in this workshop? Hardware, software, orgware are areas that we focused on and big, hairy, audacious goals. We're going to talk about that a little bit, uh, you know, really thinking outside the box. What is the ideal for our community? Thinking about network design, what is the best way to do it? and street design, what are the best practices for that to get the most amount of people out there cycling. And we had some group results, how to put theory into practice in Reno, and full report at bikewasho.org. On the bottom left-hand side, you can see Mayor Hillary Sheeby presenting on opening day and welcoming everyone. The sponsors were Mayor Hillary Sheeby, Councilman Devin Reese, Commissioner Alexis Hill, Tom Miller, who was a board member of Timba, Bird Scooters, Reno Aces, S3 Development, and Kiwanis Bike Program. They're all responsible for bringing the Dutch Cycling Embassy to Reno. And it occurred September 12th to the 14th of 2022. And our guides were Margot Darris of the Dutch Cycling Embassy, Jasper Homergesen, uh, Royal Haskenig DHV, and uh, Dick Van Veen of Dick Van Veen Street Design. And so who is the Dutch Cycling Embassy. Well, it's a it's a vast worldwide network of connections. Uh, we often think of, well, they're going to bring us the Dutch designs, but in this case, they brought us the Super Block, which is a concept out of Barcelona, Spain. The recipe is experts meet with local decision makers, planners, and cycling advocates to try to come together with a shared understanding so that we can move forward with uh, the best practices. And it's intensive, it's interactive, and hands-on over two and a half days. The RTC's goal, according to the 2020 Micromobility Report, is to have 5% of trips in the McCarran Loop to be uh, by micromobility. Currently, micromobility trips account for less than 1%. So if we're starting here with our goal, then, then this gives us an idea of, hey, how are we going to achieve this? And does the Dutch Cycling Embassy program work to achieve micromobility goals? Well, we've got some, thankfully, we've got some examples. Washington, D.C. Department of Transportation has invited the Dutch three times over the past decade or so. DDOT planner Will Hansfield told the Truckee Meadows Bicycle Alliance that they focus on protected paths only now. That means that they're not just doing paint. They've installed 100 miles of protected infrastructure for less than $50 million. And what are the results? Women are cycling uh, much more. The number of women cycling has increased from 25% to 45% of all the cyclists. And 10% of their trips in the city core are by bike. So that's double 
what Reno's goals are. So yes, it does work. Here's an example of some of the things that we saw in Washington, D.C. Um, there was a protected path. This is a shared use path. And then on the right, uh, some art in the street. And you could see that they've converted the center turn lanes into bicycle lanes. Here's how they're doing the protected bike paths. Uh, they only cost 500000 to 750000 per mile, and they're putting uh, these kind of curb bumpers. And as you can see there, there's a school bus parked in the bicycle lane. And yeah, there's going to be problems along the way, and nothing is perfect, but it does work. Uh, here's another one, uh, some more examples of the bike lanes that the Washington, D.C. has installed to achieve success. And there are... Uh, some islands as well, and Reno's planning to put in something similar here in Reno. Then there's a floating bus ramp. So the bus pulls up to this, and then people can get off, and they're not blocking the bike lane, and bikes can pass through. Of course, this means that the cars need to wait, but uh, there are compromises on both sides, so cars need to wait a little bit, and bikes can pass through. So who has the knowledge? Uh, you know, the stuff that we're going to go through here uh, from the Dutch Cycling Embassy, you can see the participants from each organization here. What are the keys to success? Well, cycling happiness. That's really what we want to achieve. If people are happy, then they're going to do it more. The basic guiding principle. Safety. Uh, conflict is unavoidable, so we need separated bike lanes. We also want uh, forgiving infrastructure. That means that if you make a mistake, you're not going to die. Uh, coherence. Cycling is uh, a very safe activity unless the network is broken. It's got to be intuitive. You can't have uh, bike paths just ending suddenly. Attractiveness. There should be planters and rivers and trees all along bike paths. Um, directness. Cycling is a physical activity and we don't want to make people take much longer routes than cars. Comfort. Minimize stops and gradients. Um, let's talk about Vine Street. So Vine Street is a good example of what we're talking about with gradients. Vine Street uh, has a proposal for a protected path, and that's underway currently now in 2024. Um, it's really too steep. And so look at the red part here. Uh, it's, it's not direct. It doesn't connect to 7th or Rancho San Rafael Park. Uh, so it's forcing people to take a longer detour on their bike. It's not very comfortable because it's a, 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 a steep gradient. And the picture in the upper right, uh, this guy is walking his bike up the hill because he's just not strong enough to get up there, even on a mountain bike. Uh, later on, uh, when he was at the top, he did get on his bike and he started riding down. So there's nothing wrong with his bike. It's just the steep hill. Um, meanwhile, one block over is Washington Street, and that's the picture on the bottom right, where there's no gradient. And... Uh, it's much more comfortable to ride on. We really shouldn't be doing that. And then I guess the fourth violation here of the DCE tenants is listen to the advocates and the recommendations of the experts here in a partnership. That's what the government should be doing when developing these protected bike paths. And in the case of Vine Street, um, the Trucking Meadows Bicycle Alliance um, does not feel listened to. And we do not feel that the city is following and RTC are following best practices here. And the result is that fewer people will use the bike path. So the Dutch concept applied in Reno, are our paths dapper, uh, direct, accessible, protected, presentable, equitable, and responsible. So responsible means that are we doing it in a way that isn't going to injure people? Or, and is it equitable? Can, can people actually use the path? Is it fair to ask people to ride a bike up a steep hill, for instance? So how to achieve goals? A simple design and there's some complicated dynamics, according to the Dutch. Uh, you know, how do we not do these kinds of projects like Vine Street anymore and pick a, a more feasible street like Washington in the future? So we examine three elements, hardware, software, and orgware. Hardware uh, is the built environment. Traditionally in Reno, bikes are in the fast zone with cars. Here on the left, you can see that we took a tour with the Dutch. Uh, and uh, you can see that there's the bike path on the left, and it's right next to where cars go. And then the protected part is there on the left where people are walking. And you can see um, on the right-hand side, there is a current proposal to also have bikes in the fast zone with cars with a, a minimal buffer there. 
uh, and compared to the Washington DC model, the Washington DC model, which is on the right hand side of this picture here, you can see that there is a hardened barrier. In Reno, we're using rolling curbs, which allows cars to just kind of fly right up onto uh, the bike path and potentially hit people. So the ideal in terms of hardware, and this is in page 11 of the report, in the U.S., cyclists and cars are in the fast zone. Pedestrians are in the, quote, slow zone. In the slow zone, people are walking and smiling and chatting, and we believe that cyclists have more in common with pedestrians in how they behave and what they require and desire. That is visible in the basis of how we design. Cycling belongs in the slow zone as well. So again, in DC, on the picture on the right, you can see that uh, there is a hardened barrier there and the cyclists are in the, quote, slow zone. Let's talk about software for just a minute. Uh, what are the attitudes and plans and laws? Are they supportive of uh, cycling and the, the activity that we want to incentivize? For instance, in, in downtown Reno, cyclists aren't allowed to ride on the sidewalk, so they have to ride in traffic and there's no protected bike paths for them. So that's an example of not supportive laws. Orgware, uh, government businesses and advocates, um, are there subsidies and promotion of cycling and is money being um, provided to encourage this activity? Um, government has to bring us all together to achieve these goals. And, and they have in 2023 for the first time, the Regional Transportation Commission funded the Ride Reno event uh, that brought out about 30 people uh, from the Hispanic community and others to uh, ride around downtown and look at infrastructure and learn how to use it. Challenges are universal in cities. Uh, there's very limited space. We have to share space with cars and we allocate a small percentage of space for sustainable transportation. We have to be willing to do that, just a small percentage. And we need political will to stand up um, for safety against negative voices. So often there are people who say, well, I'm gonna lose my parking spot. Safety matters more than somebody losing the parking spot right in front of their business or house. They can walk a, a short distance from their parking spot to their house or business. Groups identified some certain goals in, in the Dutch Cycling Embassy visit. Uh, our goals are to reduce deaths, improve air quality, have more attractive downtown, for instance. The cycling goals are uh, protected bike lanes to bring more cyclists and make cycling more accessible. And we came up with 14 reasons why we want more cycling. Reduce congestion, improve quality of life, convenience, senior freedom, for instance. Remove stigmas, uh, the beauty of the town, and save money. Also be a year-round community. Finally, improving the economy. Uh, Bird uh, Scooters uh, sponsored a study that found that each scooter accounts for an additional $1,800 in spending. Now let's think about the hardware and thinking ahead. Protected bike paths uh, belong in the slow zone, right? And if we do this, then we're going to end up with more people cycling. That's the DC lesson. Hotels, restaurants, bars will offer e-bike charging stations. Uh, maybe some secured bike parking. An example of that is uh, bike boxes at UNR are in high demand. Bike boxes in downtown could be installed. Uh, is it time for a bike parking garage? Uh, having pop-up bike uh, parking. Um, the Truckee Meadows Bicycle Alliance offers a bike valet. Uh, Tahoe has uh, also has offered bike valet, and this past year they reported parking over 2,000 bicycles. Software is the human behavior. Um, improved social equity and equality as a result of uh, more cycling infrastructure. We're creating a mobility hub uh, that could be a bus station, for instance. And branding, all of the elements should be similar or look the same. The orgware is a cohesive vision. What's the cycling vision and culture here in Reno? Those are the questions that we had to ask ourselves. Um, who do we want to cater to? Well, we want to cater to the interested but concerned group. That's about 60% of people who want to ride, but they just don't feel safe. So that's who we want to cater to, and the protected bike paths do that for them. Um, do we need fancy or basic bike paths, like really expensive ones, or can we get by with cheap ones like they do in Washington, D.C.? Do we have enough funds and priorities for the expensive bike paths? 
Uh, do we have local leaders? And yes, we do. We have Mayor Sheevy, uh, uh, Councilwoman Breckis, uh, Commissioner Hill, Mayor Lawson of Sparks as well. Uh, do we have the, uh, the, the, the studies and the active transportation plan is an example of, of what we have that um, can help us towards these goals. B big, hairy, audacious, goal, audacious goals. Uh, cycling, a cycling city is not built overnight. It requires long-term vision, a dedicated policymakers, uh, an evolutionary approach. And think big and think forward. So what did the teams come up with? Uh, by 2025, the vision is uh, have a car-free school zone, uh, 25 complete connected bike trails. Currently, bike trails are not connected in Reno. They're often broken. Uh, a bike stress map. So where are people stressed out when they're riding? Um, a bike-friendly intersection standard. So what are our standards to be a, a bike uh, to be bike friendly? Uh, Pop-up bike parking and repair stations citywide. Uh, bike valet offering that. We did start that in 2023 at the Truckee Meadows Bicycle Alliance. Apps for people to provide input on where infrastructure should be improved. And su a successful PR campaign on the part of the Regional Transportation Commission should be implemented. Is there a micromobility hub in Reno? And on the left-hand side, you can see that there's a red square around where the uh, the bus station is currently the bike paths end before they get to the bike to the bus station so it's not a micro mobility hub but it could be with uh, a simple fix to that and here's an example of fixing that uh, the the bus station as a micro mobility hub the the green path there would uh, close off Evan streets Evan Street to cars and bikes could pass through easily uh, to the bus station and safely. And so that's an example of a micromobility hub that we designed with the help of the Dutch Cycling Embassy here in Reno. And Reno is planning to make uh, a bike path on Evans and Lake Street. So they're taking this to heart. Positives in terms of hardware. Well, we have wide roads and we have scooter share and uh, we have natures and rivers and, and, and mountains. And then here are all the streets that are proposed for protected paths. Uh, the negatives in terms of hardware is the cost of separated bike lanes in Reno. Currently, the proposals would spend about $10 million per mile to install bike paths versus the cost in Washington, D.C., where they're doing it for $750,000 dollars per mile. It's almost cost prohibitive under the current methods that we have here in Reno, and it doesn't need to be that expensive. Uh, lack of neighborhood access to these bike paths so that the neighborhoods are not connected to the bike paths. They're on major roads, but it's not clear how people in neighborhoods will get to those bike paths. Grid mobility has not been a priority. As we mentioned earlier, uh, most of the bike paths are not connected in Reno. It's just been, they've been put in where it's convenient. And then suddenly if you're riding a bike, then the bike path suddenly ends. And that's uh, disconcerting for people. They, they never want to ride again if they're riding in a bike path and then suddenly it ends and they're spit out into traffic. Software positives. We have a student population here, which tends to ride bikes. Uh, we have outdoor recreation as part of our culture, and local businesses support active mobility. Uh, we have a festival culture, as people like to ride their bikes to festivals. Uh, we have farmers, markets, and, and health is a big focus here. The software negatives are a lack of data. We just don't know how many people are riding, and that makes it difficult. There's the idea that if you install bike paths, then homeless will kind of be more mobile, uh, known as unsavory people by some leaders in our community. Uh, so we need to change that culture and that perspective. Network design. It's currently not forgiving infrastructure. That means that if somebody makes a mistake, it could be deadly. Um, and so we need a more forgiving infrastructure. Uh, pedestrians are in the slow zone and the cyclists are in the fast zone and that's uncomfortable for cyclists. Uh, network design, the ideal is to have that forgiving infrastructure like we talked about, uh, that you're not going to die if you make a mistake. Uh, pedestrians should be in the slow zone and so should the cyclists.
So with the network, as we mentioned, we've built bike paths where it is easy, where the roads are wide and the paths fit easily with little pain for parking. Free parking should not be a priority over the health and safety of children and families. So in thinking about the network, according to the Dutch Cycling Embassy, we designed the network based on what people need, not where it is easy to build or where it's going to be least impactful for parking. We need to identify the major destinations, the strengths and weaknesses of those destinations, create a metro style corridor map for cycling and uh, take into account road classification for protection. So we'll talk about that in just a minute. Uh, according to the speed of that road. The network, and talking about the super block, uh, this is out of Spain, and this is what the Dutch brought to us. Uh, every few blocks, uh, there's an arterial road, and then other roads are traffic calmed. Uh, the result is more active transportation. So people may be on the major arterial, and then they pull off and park, and then they start to walk or ride, uh, and so there's only a few of these major arterials. And then there are certain routes that are completely closed to vehicles. Let's talk about the uh, Dutch versus the U.S. separation standards. The U.S. separation standards are really inadequate. Uh, 30 miles per hour versus 20 mile per hour is a good example. On the right-hand side, you can see the uh, U.S. standard, which is you install a protected bike lane at 30 miles per hour. But uh, if you look on the left-hand side, the Dutch standard is that cyclists who are hit at 30 miles per hour, they found that the death rate is 85%. Cyclists hit at 20 miles per hour, the death rate is only 15%. So separated bike paths should be installed at 20 miles per hour, not at 30 miles per hour. And we all know that drivers don't follow the speed limits anyway. So it's even more important to install protected bike paths at 20 miles per hour and above on any road that is 20 miles per hour and above. On page 18 of the Dutch Cycling Embassy report, it says that in order to create a protected bike lanes, road space has to be reallocated. Currently, the streets of Reno allow a lot of space for cars. Uh, Center Street is a good example. If you took out just one lane of car traffic, we could create space for a bi-directional bike path with a line of trees uh, that would make people happy. And Reno is making progress in terms of uh, separated paths. Here on Virginia Street, this is the proposal, there would be a buffer there on Virginia Street. It is a high volume street. Even, even though there are low speeds, it is a high volume street. So a buffer is needed according to federal standards. But again, we do need to try to surpass those minimum federal standards. You can see there that the speed limit is 25. Uh, it really needs a, a separated path. Here's some examples of protected paths in our community now. Uh, Veterans uh, River Path and the, the Pyramid, uh, they're fully separated. Sparks Boulevard has a hardened barrier. Fifth Street in downtown Reno um, has on-street parking and parking protected uh, bike path. That's in the picture on the left-hand side. As you can see, somebody's put a dumpster in the bike path. But it's an example of uh, forgiving infrastructure. My daughters there were able to ride out into the street and not get hit by that car that's coming up on them. They didn't even need to look out. They could just go around the dumpster and then right back into the bike lane. So forgiving infrastructure. Good job, City of Reno. Victorian Avenue has uh, vegetation and on-street parking as well. And Holcomb, Kitsky, they have buffers there. And on Lincoln Street, concrete barriers to Sparks Marina. So if we have these paths, why aren't more people using them? In addition to areas for improvement in hardware, orgware, and software, we need to use the following standards to get people to use the bike paths. People will not use bike paths if they don't meet all of these standards. They've got to be safe. Um, conflict is unavoidable. We need to use eye contact, and we have to have these, safe, these protected, separated bike lanes so that surpass federal standards. Victorian Avenue is a great example of the uh, dapper concept. This is the uh, adaptation of the previous slide, uh, the, dapter, the dapper concept for Reno. Direct, accessible, protected, presentable, equitable, and responsible. So with dapper, we are applying the Dutch concepts to every bike path in Reno when we install them. And then we did some fun, some non-bike fun with the Dutch, went up to Virginia City. There are no bike lanes up there.
<laughs> now, here's how we can bring back the Dutch cycling embassy. Similar to Washington, D.C., Reno and Sparks can bring back the Dutch to help solve particular problems. So in Washington, D.C., they had a problem with a freeway overpass, and they didn't know how to get cyclists uh, you know, from A to B. So they paid the local cycling advocates to bring the Dutch cycling embassy back. That means that local government can provide the Truckee Meadows Bicycle Alliance with funding to pay for the Dutch cycling embassy to come back and ensure that we are continuing to make progress in our community. Thank you again. This has been a presentation by the Truckee Meadows Bicycle Alliance. I'm Kai Plaskon. Right on.